I have like three mics to turn on, so because everybody wants to hear me, we'll go ahead and turn all these mics on. And I'll take this off so I can breathe. Oh, my goodness, ladies, this is so exciting for me because this last year I was the associate teaching director, but I only got to do my teachings to y'all, but in front of my computer screen. So I would do my lesson and I'd do my study and then I would go and stare at myself in my computer screen and my little tiny dot of a camera. And then my son would take it to iMovie on his computer and then he would like put in my PowerPoints, which we'll have here, and make it look all good and shiny. And the worst part, he said, was trying to dub up the audio with my lips when you'd make a cut and put it back together. So I said, well, this was hard work, so I will pay you with Taco Bell. So he definitely enjoyed his Taco Bell payment. So I am so glad to be with you today as we're studying Daniel. Wow, ladies, we're just getting started. This is gonna be an amazing study if you haven't thought so already. Here it's gonna continue. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Daniel. We thank you for the book that he has written, the man that he was, how he sought after you, how he prayed, how he worshiped, and how he gave you the glory. Lord, we pray that we do that in our lives as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. was a doctor. Now you might have known Oliver Wendell Holmes. You probably have heard the name and go, that sounds familiar, but how do I know him? Maybe it doesn't matter, maybe it does. Junior was, a Supreme, was on the Supreme Court, but his father was a doctor, and he loved to study the, the effects of ether. So he decided, in order to understand it, I'm gonna get put under with ether. So he had a dose administered, and as he was going under in kind of a dreamy state, he, a profound thought came to him, and he was so excited. So when he came back after being asleep with the ether, he was trying to figure out, what was that? I can't remember. I have no idea what that was. Okay, let's do this again. So this time I'm gonna have a stenographer at the bedside so that as I'm going to sleep again, I'll get this wonderful thought. It's gonna change the universe. Everybody's gonna be astounded. So sure enough, here he goes, he's going under, and he sees the stenographer writing, so he must be saying something, right? So he wakes up, comes out of it, and says, read it back to me, read it back, what did I say? Yeah, uh -huh. this is the great thought. Um, the entire universe is permeated with a strong odor of turpentine. <laughs> and if you ever smelled ether, that's what it smells like. So this is maybe not the life-changing, altering interpretation of a dream that uh, we will see today, but for him, this is what he went to. So we're gonna look at our overview. We're gonna have three different sections today, giving credit to whom it is due in verses 24 through 30. God sets up and God brings down kingdoms in verses 31 through 45. Faithful servants of God will be rewarded in verses 46 through 49. So we'll start with giving credit to whom it's due in verses 24 through 30. So as Eric and I were talking back and forth, we decided, you know what, we're going to read these scriptures to you just as they are written in the Bible, because we may say something that doesn't make any sense, but God's word is true and you can count on it. So we're going to read those scriptures and then I'll do some explanations. So verse 24, therefore Daniel went into Arioch. Daniel went to Arioch whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king, in haste, and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. Daniel had just finished praying, right, in our study last week. He had just finished praying with his friends for God to reveal this mystery of the king's dream. God had revealed that mystery to him and what the interpretation was. And then Daniel did what? What's our Bible verse? He praised God in Daniel verses, uh, 2, verses 20 through 22. So we start this section off with the verse that says, therefore. Now, I had a high school teacher who always said, ask, always ask this, what is therefore, therefore? Makes sense, right? So in this case, it is telling us that after Daniel praised God, he did the next logical thing, and that he went to find Arioch and went to request to be, go before the king. What boldness and courage 
Daniel had just to go to Arioch, now he's gonna to have to go before the king. This boldness came from who? No one else but the Lord. Arioch is purely thinking of himself when he presents Daniel before the king. He took the credit for finding Daniel, which we saw Daniel went, so it wasn't Arioch, uh, to finding hope that would further ingratiate himself. Arioch thought, what else can I do? How can I get better? How can I get bigger? Who, who can look at me more? That was all Arioch was thinking about. But all the while, Daniel gives credit to God. We'll continue reading in verses 26. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar? Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me not because of any wisdom that I have more than all living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. Daniel knew to keep his mouth shut as he stands in front of the king. He will wait until he is spoken to. The king is skeptical. What young kid is this who, can, who says he can do this when all of my magicians can't help me out? Who is this kid? In contrast to Arioch, Daniel gave credit to God from the very beginning. He was trying to save his life, the life of his three friends, and all of these magicians that were there in Babylon. Daniel knew that the only reason he could stand before the king was because he had God's favor. The magicians of the day displayed the wisdom of Babylon on earth. Hmm, on earth, yeah, that's not much wise. Where Daniel's God displayed the wisdom of God, who is where? In heaven, he sees it all, he knows it all. Nothing is impossible with Daniel's God. We see also in the New Testament, as Jesus is talking to the disciples and to the rich young man in Matthew 19, 26, Jesus says, he looked at them and said, with this man, with, excuse me, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. We can't do it on our own, but with God, we can do it all. God is revealing to King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the last days. He doesn't go into a lot of detail, but rather kind of just gives a general overview of the future. Those details will come in chapter 7, ladies, so stick around. There's more good to come. But the last days, or the latter days, as it says in the ESV, occurs 13 times in the Old Testament. And it all refers back to the future which forms the close of history. So for them, it was the future that's going to talk about the closing of history, beginning from the Babylonian Empire and ending with the return of Christ. Of course, Daniel has piqued the king's interest. What king wouldn't want to know how his kingdom's going to end? Or what the future will be? Will I be even greater than I am today? Will I conquer more lands? What will it be? Daniel goes on to explain that perhaps as the king was falling asleep, he was pondering what would become of his great kingdom. Daniel had an answer for him, but also one that would save his friends and all of the wise men of Babylon. F.B. Meyer says, the only hope of a decreasing self is an increasing Christ. We saw last week how Daniel used tact when he spoke to Arioch, how much more important it is here in front of King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel gave the king the truth, which allowed him to determine the future. A life well lived is a light to those in spiritual darkness. Next, our next section is God sets up and God brings down kingdoms. So we'll start with verse 31. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image, this image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you. Did you think you had to put sunglasses on, maybe? And its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold. 
its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, and its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You can see in this next picture an image that we'll look at a couple times here, but this is, you know, a, our likeness of what he saw. Who knows what he actually saw? Um, it probably wasn't the statue's appearance that really frightened him so much as what's to come to the statue later on. But what does it look like, right? God speaks to Nebuchadnezzar in a language that he completely understands. Outward splendor, right? Images of greatness. It's humongous. It's shiny. This is what a king or a ruler wants. He wants to be bigger than life. So maybe this is exactly what God is showing him. Uh, many commentators stated that Nebuchadnezzar had recently conquered Egypt, and so while he was there, he saw many larger-than-life items, like the burial tombs with the sphinxes out in front. So maybe that's why he was having a larger-than-life dream. Daniel goes on to describe the statue and all the different metals that are used. It is interesting to note that as the metals increase in strength, they decrease in value. This statue represents a change in power and rulers, an actual shift in history. I never knew this before I did this study, that how pivotal this was in our history. When Jerusalem fell to Nebuchadnezzar, the line of David was no longer in power. So the line of David had ruled through David and Solomon, and then we have all of our judges, so it now fell into the hands of the Gentiles, and we are still living under that rule today, and will be until Jesus comes and takes back his throne as our rightful king. We'll go on to verse 34 next. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken into pieces and became like the chaff of summer on the threshing floors, and the wind carried it away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. On our picture here, you can see it hit the foundation, right? So this stone seems to just appear from the earth and doesn't hit the statue in its body where you think it would be, you know, just take it out, but its foundation. The feet and toes are where it is broken. And we see that those toes are representative of soon-to-be modern-day kingdoms, where they are not in power now. The statue is then destroyed and becomes as chaff. So what is chaff? So you look up the definition of chaff, right? What is that exactly? We don't really thresh corn anymore or hay, so what does this mean to us? Um, so anyway, it's the pieces or the coverings of the seed or the corn that is blown away by the wind. It's a worthless part of this seed, of the corn. And other terminology would be trash, something you just don't want, you just don't need anymore. Let's get rid of it. I don't want it around anymore. Psalm 1-4, so we, we read, you read in our, up on the screens, Psalm 1, 1 through 3, and I'm going to continue with that. We're talking about the people that the Lord had blessed, but here he says, not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. I don't want to be a wicked person. I don't want to be one that, with God throwing me away. All those great kingdoms, solid metals, are completely obliterated. Nothing left but what remains the stone. It is still there. Throughout scripture, we see mountains referred to as kingdoms. In Isaiah 2.2, it says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains, and it will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Wouldn't you love to see Nebuchadnezzar's face right now? I think he turned from prove it to me to like jaw on the floor, right? Awe struck. What is it? Here's this young kid who I brought into my country, who I indoctrinated into my culture, and he's telling me my dream. Shock. At this point, Daniel didn't even ask, so did I get it right? Nope. He just jumps right in and boldly stated what God had already revealed to him. And here we go in verse 36. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, 
Notice they are lowercase k's, just so we're all on the same page. To whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory. And into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Of course I am, says Nebuchadnezzar. (laughs) Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks into pieces and shatters all things. And like iron crushes, it shall break and crush all of these. An interesting pronoun is used there in verse 36. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. Daniel was referring to himself and to God, right? He knew none of this would be possible without God's revelation to him at that night after he had prayed. He then goes on to explain how Nebuchadnezzar is in power because why? God had allowed it. Jeremiah 25, 8 and 9, we see this predicted as Jeremiah speaks to the people of Judah. Therefore, the Lord Almighty says this, because you have not listened to my words, I will summon all the peoples of the north and my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, declares the Lord, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and an everlasting ruin. I do not want to be the the people of Judah. (laughs) <laughs> and in fact, later on, in two chapters later, in 27, 5 through 8, it talks about how the Lord made the earth and everything in it. And verse 6 specifically says, Now I will give all your countries into the hands of my servant, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. I will make even the wild animals subject to him. Nebuchadnezzar was put in place by God. This was no luck of the draw. This was specifically place for this time. And he is probably Nebuchadnezzar, the first great world ruler and probably the greatest that ever has been and ever will be until the Lord returns. Represented by the head of gold, his son and his grandson will follow in succession of him until they are overtaken by the Medo-Persian kingdom, represented by the chest and arms of silver. There's dates and all that on there which we will not go into all that today. But then the Greco-Macedonian kingdom led by Alexander the Great comes into power, represented by the belly and the thighs of bronze. And Rome is the fourth kingdom represented by the legs of iron. Rome was known for its superior iron weapons with which they used to crush all of their enemies and demolish them. So verse 41 will go on to, and as you saw the feet and toes, two feet, 10 toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron. It shall be a divided kingdom, right? But some of the firmness of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together. That's not gonna last, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all of these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever, just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke into pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king What shall be after this? This dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Talk about confidence. Daniel had it 100%. So we looked back at verses 31 through 40. Those are all verses that have been fulfilled in history to date. But these remain in verses 41 through 49, or through 46, basically, have not been fulfilled yet. More time is spent on these, on this last kingdom, than all of the others combined. I mean, you look and it's just like one one sentence and it combines two of the kingdoms. But as we continue our study in Daniel, little heads up, ladies, we will be looking at more of the specifics of these kingdoms in chapter 7. Chapter 7, chapter 7, chapter 7. But here, I don't believe God thought it was necessary for Nebuchadnezzar to have all that information, so we won't go into it this week. 
We'll save that for Erica, maybe. I don't remember who gets that one. Um, but we see that this last kingdom is a kingdom divided. So 10 toes, right? They'll probably work together as one, like you do in a foot, right? And some of them will potential, have potential alliances through strategically aligned marriages. Um, but what will be the end of those kingdoms, right? So we've seen the end of all of these kingdoms. How's, how are these going to come to an end? The stone. Don't forget the stone. This is the most important part, which represents Jesus Christ will come and establish itself as the greatest kingdom known to man, and it will never be conquered. No other will come after it. That is it. That's the final kingdom. Matthew 21, 44 says, Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Matthew Henry has a commentary, and he lists some more information about the stone, which we can see here. It's a kingdom not of this world, so it is not set up by man. This is God's kingdom, set up and given authority for Jesus Christ to rule this. It's set up in the times of the last kingdoms. When that will be, we aren't sure. Will it decay? Nope. Or will it be succeeded? It will not be. It is a victorious kingdom and an everlasting kingdom. Ladies, let that give you hope that as a believer, if you have Jesus in your heart, you are in that kingdom. You will get to live in this kingdom forever and ever. Amen. Tony Evans says, if you are diagnosed with a disease, you do not want your doctor to spare your feelings and lie to you. You want your doctor to tell you the truth so you can get the right treatment. The saying, take two aspirins and call me in the morning, aren't going to work if you have cancer. The truth hurts. But just like a disease, you have to hear about your problem in order to address it. When you have God's truth, on your subject, on any subject, you can be fearlessly bold like Daniel and declare that truth. Just another reason why it's so important to memorize scripture. Have we drilled that into you today? Hide God's word in your heart. A life well lived is a light to those who are in spiritual darkness. Section, last section, C. Faithful servants of God will be rewarded in Daniel 2, 46 through 49. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering, an incense, be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts, made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon, all those men whose lives he saved, right? Daniel made a request to the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we said in Leaders' Council, SMA, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. Take yourself for a moment and say you're in a large courtroom, perhaps. Can you imagine Joe Biden, Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, the ruler of China, falling before a Jewish Christian and acknowledging his God is the only true God? Can you imagine that? That's impossible, right? That's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. Oh. The highest, most powerful leader in the known world at that time falls down and worships Daniel. The king clearly understood that Daniel's God was the true revealer of mysteries. But at this time, he still believes Daniel's God is just supreme to all of his other gods. He worships many other gods, so this is just the best of those. It isn't, it isn't until chapter 4, so now you've got to come back before chapter 7, so come back for chapter 4, because we'll see these seeds of truth take root and make a changed life and see King Nebuchadnezzar's life bear fruit. An important test of character is how do you accept praise and exaltation? Daniel remains humble and submissive, not haughty and presumptuous. Recall what happened to the chief cupbearer when he was restored and forgot Joseph. A man of character, he remembers. Have you ever watched how a bird sleeps on its perch and never falls off? How does it manage to do this? This was very interesting to me. The secret is the tendons of the bird's legs. Here's their leg, 
There's a little ten tiny, tiny, it's like tiny tendon. They are so constructed that when the leg is bent at the knee, so their knees go backwards, right? The claws contract and grip like steel. The claws refuse to let go until the knees are unbent again. The bended knee gives the bird the ability to hold on to that perch so tightly, even through winds and rains and storm. Is this not also the secret of the holding power of the Christian today? Daniel found this to be true, surrounded by pagan environment, tempted to compromise with evil, urged to weaken his grip on God. He refused to let go. He held firm when others faltered because he was a man of prayer. He knew the power of that bended knee. From sleeping birds, we can learn the secret of holding on to things which are most precious to us. Honesty, purity, thoughtfulness, honor, your character. That secret is the knee bent in prayer, seeking to get a firmer grip on those values which make life worth living. When we hold firmly to God in prayer, we can rest assured that he will hold tightly to us. Faithful servants of God will be re re rewarded either now and or in eternity because a life well lived is a light to those in spiritual darkness. Stanley Jones says a prayer is surrender, surrender to the will of God and cooperation with that will. If I throw out a boat hook, from a boat and catch hold of the shore and start to pull, do I pull the shore to me or do I pull myself to the shore? Prayer is not pulling God to my will, but an aligning of my will to God's will. As a result of Daniel's faithful habits of prayer and humility, God was able to use him in front of the most powerful man in the world. He planted seeds of faith that would soon be harvested for God's glory. What habits do you have in place today to be a light in this dark world? Heavenly Father, we thank you for Daniel. We thank you for his example of godliness, of going before you, of seeking you first and foremost. Lord, let us learn to do that. Let us hold tight to who you are in these te terribly chaotic times. You are the rock, the steady foundation, and we claim that in you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, ladies.